So welcome to the Compounding Center Connections, where we talk about different health conditions with our partnered practitioners. I'm your host, Jay Gill, the owner and a compounding pharmacist from the Compounding Center in Leesburg, Virginia. At the Compounding Center, we collaborate with practitioners, create custom medications to help patients, and even our four-legged patients to get better. In today's episode, we have Dr. Jolie Jarbo with us. We are going to talk about the use of CBD oil in pets. As you can see in the opening slide, Dr. Jarbo has a wealth of knowledge and experience in the veterinary neurology field. I was at a symposium last year when I sat in on a seminar uh, given by Dr. Jarbo. Jarbo. Her presentation to the practitioner was on the use of CBD oil in pets. And her passion for the use of the CBD oil spoke to me that since then we have partnered together to educate our local practitioners and, uh, and owners uh, and pet owners on the use of CBD oil. She has a deep knowledge on the subject and I'm excited to have her on the episode today. So let's begin. So Dr. Jarbo, could you please introduce yourself and your company? Sure will. Thanks, Jay, for having me. It's been just a phenomenal experience working with you, and especially with the compounding pharmacy in Leesburg. We trust you all explicitly and send clients your way every day. As far as who I am, I'm a veterinary neurologist, neurosurgeon, I practice here in Leesburg, Virginia, and I've been a veterinary neurologist, neurosurgeon for over 25 years. Um, the cannabinoids kind of fell into my lap about 15 years ago uh, when I was out in Vegas, when I started noticing owners bringing supplements to me and telling me that they were using them as adjuvant ther therapies for different problems within their pet. Like everyone else uh, in the medical profession, I was a skeptic. I, you know, I didn't believe that these things had any merit. And, but the big thing, the big difference with me is I, I am very open to seeing how things pan out. As a neurologist, and because I'm a veterinary neurologist dealing in brain and spinal cord injuries or diseases and, and animals, I, you know, my patients don't speak. So I, I tend to be a voyeur in the medical realm. So this lends itself perfectly to, to my mental attitude. You know, I just sat back and watched and waited to see, can these, uh, are these supplements really helping these pets or are we dealing with a placebo effect? And, and I was really blown away. And that kind of, that definitely piqued my interest. Uh, and encouraged me to delve into this further. I probably am one of the top 10 or 15 veterinary cannabinoid specialists in the world. I'm asked to speak all over uh, on this topic. Um, you couldn't have told me or convinced me 20 years ago that this would be the direction my life took. But it, it's something that uh, we all need to know about because it's out there and people are using it and to be educated you know, goes to our veterinary oath. You know, we are supposed to be the source of information. And, and so I kind of I took that to heart and wanted to know more about it. And, and here we are with Jay asking me to speak to you all. Well, thank you very much. And uh, I think I, uh, this is the reason I wanted to, one of the reasons to have you on the episode is I wanted to bring credible information uh, to pet owners on the use of CBD oil. So um, now, you know, let's just get some basic information kind of out of the way to help uh, the listeners uh, understand some uh, terminology, but what is CBD oil? Yeah, there is a lot of jargon out there and a lot of things to sift through. Uh, typically, when people use the word CBD oil, and I'll do the famous air quotes here, you know, um, they are referring to industrial hemp oil. Uh, taken from the industrial hemp plant. Now there's there's two, you know, two, there's cannabis, you know, and they're all derived from cannabis. As a veterinarian, this is a perfect analogy. You know, you've got a dog who's a canine, but you have a Sharpay, you've got a Chihuahua, you have a Pekingese, you've got a Great Dane. So we've got all these different breeds or cultivars when you're talking the hemp cannabis lingo. So you have different strains or cultivars. Basically, you can equate that to different breeds of plants. And so CBD oil often refers to an extraction from the industrial hemp plant. And this is where our terminology kind of takes, you know, a first step. What is industrial hemp and what's marijuana? Now, they're two, they are of the same, you know, cannabis plant. And basically it comes down to what's their intent or use. Uh, Marijuana has very high THC, which is the intoxicating part of the plant that some people use for medicinal reasons, some people use for recreational, and some ride the fence and say it's recreational medicine. 
So, you know, we've got that aspect of it. Where industrial hemp plant is definitely a different component. It, it to be classified as hemp, it has to have by the US government less than 0.3% THC. That is critically important when you're dealing with my patients, uh, dogs and cats. They're keenly sensitive to the effects of THC because of their very high CB1 receptors in the brain. CB1 is what THC hits on. And so you can get very intoxicating effects uh, in our animals with just minuscule amounts of THC. So again, when you're looking at CBD oil, it can be derived from cannabis, from marijuana. I'm sorry, it can be derived from marijuana plants. You are typically going to get that type of CBD oil from a dispensary. So that's not something that you can just walk into Walgreens and buy or at your gas station. You know, you're, that would be illegal in most states unless you're at a dispensary where they, they have the certification to, to make and manufacture that and dispense that to you. Uh, industrial hemp oil, because 2000, uh, let's see, two years ago, President Trump signed into bill um, that industrial hemp was perfectly legal as long as a U.S. sanctioned crop and it had 0.3% less THC. There's some other parameters involved in that legislation, but that's the key point is the level of THC in industrial hemp. And again, most often people refer to CBD oil, they're referring to that CBD oil extracted from the industrial hemp plant. And when we look at that, you know, we have um, CBD oil, we have isolates. You know, what is the difference in those things? When you're talking about CBD, it's kind of, it stands for cannabidiol. That's actually just one cannabinoid, and that's a constituent or a component of this cannabis plant. It has over 480 biologically active components to it, and of those, we've identified about 110 cannabinoids. CBD, cannabidiol, is just one of those. It, it usually is in the second highest uh, percentage or quantity of the cannabinoids. And so we can, we can tweak these plants to have more, say more CBD, we can tweak them to have more THC, and they're even getting more sophisticated uh, with these cultivars and having the lesser known cannabinoids like CBD or CBG. Um, and so those things can be uh, modified just like our breed strains. An isolate is when you go in and you remove one component of that, say we want just THC we can remove that and that'll be an isolate. You won't have the other uh, 480 biologically active ingredients in that oil, you'll just have that THC. Um, and so that, there's some people, there's a debate on what's what's better, full spectrum or isolate. And I, I have to say, I think it really depends on what you're, what you're trying to go for, you know? And so I, I, I'm a big component of full spectrum because I think it's a lot like Jenga. You know, when you take out one piece of that building block, the whole thing can come crumbling down. We, we don't know how all of these things work within our cells, within our body. And, you know, that plant has all of those for a reason. Uh, I believe in the full spectrum. Let's take it in. Let's let our cells do with it what they will. You know, we're going to have waste products that are eliminated, you know, down the commode. And so I think that um, I, I personally, in, in my use, like full spectrum. I don't think we're sophisticated enough yet in veterinary medicine to understand the isolate part of it just yet. So uh, full spectrum basically includes all the plant parts, the terpenes and the cannabidiols. Yeah, the isolates uh, or sometimes uh, broad spectrum is what now I see most on the packaging. The broad spectrum is where they have remediated all the THC uh, from, but you still have the terpenes and the cannabidiols uh, in it also. But they have, it's kind of like, you know, mold remediation where somebody comes into your house and takes the mold out. And that's what broad spectrum is, where you'll see the product labeled as THC free. Um, yeah. That's what that is. It, now, it in so, truth, I just was going to say, it's going to be very hard to get these products 100% THC yes, yep. free. It's just like, you know, ca decaffeinated coffee. There is still a minuscule amount of, of caffeine in there. Yep. But, Thanks for clarifying that because that is, uh, yeah. it just, it may be labeled THC free, but yeah. there is minute amounts usually. Yeah. And some of them are to the hundredth power, you know, like 0.007% THC. It's still there. So, so don't be fooled on that end. Just be educated. Know that, yeah. that it's there. And if you are taking these supplements and are subjected to a drug test, there's a, a possibility, depending on the sensitivity of the test, that you could test positive and, and really be taking a legal supplement, a legal nutritional supplement. Good point. Um, now, 
the other question is, uh, you know, is it safe to use in pets? That's the biggest question I get asked at the pharmacy. Yeah, it's really a loaded question in a way. Um, I think that anything, you know, when we talk about our endocannabinoid system, you and I and anything with a spinal cord have an endocannabinoid system. The cannabinoids that we get from plants are called phytocannabinoids, and our body doesn't really distinguish between the two. So we're going to utilize, if we're ingesting or taking in phytocannabinoids, our body will see them and use them as if we made them. Just say, like, if you're low in thyroid and you take thyroxin or a thyroid supplement. You're taking in a, you know, a, a thyroid supplement that your body didn't make, but your body's use, utilizing it. So the same is true in our animals. Um, they are deficient in it. We, we feel we're all deficient in, in these cannabinoids uh, just due to the nature of how we live now. And it, you know, it was made illegal uh, by the Marijuana Tax Act in you know, the late uh, 1930s. Um, and so it was taken away from us where it was in all of our foodstuffs or building materials. Um, you know, just it, we were inundated with it. So our body over the 10,000 years has been keyed up to use this. And by, by the nature of, of our animals, the same thing. They grazed on this substance. They, you know, and held it. But when it can become dangerous, there's, there's several key points. You know, we want um, processing, I think, is one of the number one uh, things that we've got to touch upon. The extraction methodology is vast. There are people out there using butane and ethanol. Well, I don't want that in my pets. I don't want that in me. You know, you know. So those kinds of things, you've got to be very careful about the method of extraction. I think that the CO2 extraction is probably the safest by far out there uh, to give you the most pure, you know, full spectrum uh, extract to use. I think in our animals, because so many people use what we take, you know, off the shelf, you know, you've got maybe a hemp supplement in your, in your cabinet or you go to Walgreens or CVS or the compounding pharmacy and find one. A lot of those supplements are geared towards our human palate, our taste. So you need to be very careful that they're free of things that are toxic to pets like chocolate, you know, chocolate flavorings, xylitol. Xylitol is a common sweetener that is very toxic to our dogs and cats. So we've just got to be careful about those. We want the, the other ingredients uh, to be safe for our animals. I think it's really critically important that these products be organically sourced. You know, the hemp plant is what's called a bioaccumulator. It is just a, the perfect plant for taking in nutrients. And by the same token, it'll take in toxins, pesticides, uh, heavy metals that are in the soil. And so those things will be in your full spectrum oil. You know, they're using uh, industrial hemp plants to clean up the um, Yellow River in China. They're using it to clean up the fields and, and rivers in Chernobyl. You know, and so those things, if, you know, I think buyer beware. You know, you don't know really what you're getting unless it has the, the tag and organically sourced. I think that that tells you that that is a, a clean ground that that uh, industrial hemp plant grew in and by consequence the oil should be clean but that leads us to the next thing that's critically important is the certificate of analysis you know the certificate of analysis needs to be given or easy to come by with whatever product you're using on their website or maybe a barcode on the bottle that you can scan and find and what that tells you is that 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 the the oil you know not only was it organically sourced so you have the plant taken care of but the extract, you know, because what happens from the time that seed hits the ground to grows into a plant? Are they using pesticides on it? You want that oil tested. You want that oil to be clean of heavy metals, toxins, molds, um, pesticides. And so I think that's also just, just horribly important. So I know we're going to touch upon um, how to select um, a, pro a, a good quality CBD oil for pets um, uh, a bit later on. But Talk about some of the, uh, I want you to share with everyone the, you know, the, the health conditions that you are, problems that you have used this in pets. Uh, and you have some great uh, slides and videos that you want to share. So um, let's yeah. talk about the health problems that you, you know, share with the public because uh, you'll see how, um, you know, our pets, our kids, how their, how their quality of life comes back. So I want to share that with the public. Yeah, we're going to try to get to that, if you all bear with me. Jay's trying to turn this over to me. I can do brain surgery, but this stuff is going to lose me here. 
one of the one of the biggest things that I think we need to touch on on, on safety and you know why we are looking in this and why we think we have success is is really uh, Dr. Ethan Russo. He coined the phrase or or described clinical endocannabinoid deficiency in 2004. And you know we have things that fall into that: fibromyalgia, irritable bowel syndrome, some forms of depression and anxiety, migraine headaches, some types of seizures, uh, lupus, post-traumatic stress syndrome, restless leg syndrome. Uh, and so when we we want to correlate that in veterinary medicine, you know, we, we see the same types of things. You know, we have anxiety in our pets. We've got, uh, I think, I truly believe we've got post-traumatic stress syndrome in our pets. We've got seizure and seizure-like events. We've got OCD type behavior. We've got tremors and movement disorders, uh, aggression. I always joke, uh, you know, that when I lived in Vegas, I saw inappropriate marking in our pets. We don't necessarily see that in humans, but hopefully not anyway, unless like, like I did when I lived in Vegas, but we have that in our pets. And, and I think that those things can be somewhat lumped into this endocannabinoid deficiency syndrome. And so what are some of the, the things that, that, you know, I see on that, you know, we'll, we'll go to some uh, videos and pictures. I've got a picture of a cat uh, named Ford. Uh, he has what's called stress induced um, cystitis or flute is another term for that. And, and Ford came to me, you know, just one of the veterinary technicians owned him and he had been treated for years with traditional medications, things like fluoxetine, which is Prozac, and amitriptyline, buprenex, Xanax, antibiotics. He'd been on urine acidifiers. They had him on a, a urine type diet to try to reduce these crystals. And nothing seemed to help. Um, so the owner, you know, was at her wit's end and she said, well, what do you think? Do you think um, your product, and, and I'm associated, I'm a medical advisory board uh, of a company called Zelise, um, and we'll talk about them in a, in a little bit, but their product is called UltraCell, and it's a full spectrum industrial hemp oil. If you're looking at the screen, that's what F-S-I-H-O stands for. And she wanted to know, well, can this, do you think that'll help? And then I said, well, well, why wouldn't you try it? Our traditional things haven't our traditional treatments haven't really helped Ford. So, so let's see if we can't make things a little happier between his ears. And that's one of the big um, benefits of cannabinoids is they're potent mood stabilizers. So these animals, you know, they, they have stress, you know, and I always joke that cats are, are aliens trapped in a body, you know, in this little cat body that they got confused and they spend the rest of their life trying to beam their way home. You know, these things aren't dogs as much as I want them to be dogs, you know, and I, and I don't say things in a derogatory manner. I, I love cats, but from a, from a medical standpoint, they are a challenge, you know, because you can't fool them. When they come into the veterinary clinic, they know, they know they're here and they know that something's up and, you know, you got to win them over if you can. And, and uh, so Ford had a lot of stress between those years. You know why he's lived in this household. He, he loves his family, but something, you know, just anxiety, like some of us work on a higher frequency, you know, and so uh, she tried, uh, tried him on ultracell, um, because again, these other things take wrestling with him, you know, this is supposedly a stress-induced urinary problem, where they have spasms, and they can get blocked, um, and probably within about, you know, three or four administrations, he was peeing in the litter box. His manifestation of this event was to pee outside the litter box, uh, strain, um, almost become partially blocked. He never fully blocked, but um, he was probably on ultracell about three or four months. Uh, only that, peeing inside the litter box and, and doing quite well. The owner has since stopped this. You know, we think that some of these are learned behaviors. And if you talk to an animal behavioralist, they'll say that an undesirable behavior, if you can help the animal unlearn it over four to six weeks, you may not need lifelong medications. And I think that that's gonna be potentially the case with Ford. We're probably a uh -oh. him, and then that it will need to revisit this and see if we can't you know, help him be a little calmer between the ears. Um, We've got Vinny. Vinny is a uh, macaw uh, with a 35-year-old th macaw that was brought into the household from a rescue situation. He has what's called uh, macaw wasting syndrome. It's basically the avian or bird equivalent of, of AIDS. Um, if you can't see the video, I'll try to describe the video um, on your left. He's very emaciated. His chest bone or kill is really uh, uh, sticking out, you know, kind of like the carcass at the Jarbo household on Thanksgiving. Uh, you know, the turkey carcass pick, 
full of meat. He has Popeyes. Uh, his eyes are very bulging because there's no periorbital fat. There's no tissue around that. Uh, he had been on, um, I don't treat birds, but he had been on different uh, anti-inflammatories. He had been on Celebrex. Uh, his liver value started going through the roof. They put him on Ultracell. You know, again, uh, they just, they didn't have a, uh, you know, they felt like they didn't have an alternative and they were reaching like so many of us do when we reach the end of, of what we think our medications and truth therapies are doing. We look for alternative therapies, right? And so this owner did that. Uh, the picture on the right shows a, a bird that's his chest is fully fleshed. Uh, his eyes look more normal. They don't look like, you know, he's just one of those, um, those cartoon characters with eyes bulge out. You know, if you hear the horn in the background, you know, his eyes have got very good tissue around those. When we look at uh, this next video, I love this next video. This is uh, Rafa. Rafa is a 21-year-old domestic short hair. And we'll, we'll just go through a little bit of the video. Um, if you were my age, uh, or maybe you're a big YouTube fan and you watch old, old TV shows, Carol Burnett, this just reminds me of a Tim Conway old man character where he's shuffling through the house, you know, Mr. Mr. Wiggins. And so this, this 21 year old cat has got horrible degenerative joint disease, horrible arthritis, multi-level chronic discs, and probably some degree of dementia, cortical atrophy, you know, just being 21, my God, you know, that, that is a, a blessed life this cat has led, but he's confused, he's slow to move around, uh, and doesn't quite know where, where he's at. Um, to put him on non-steroidal anti-inflammatories when you're of his age, the kidneys are probably starting to have some compromise. And non-steroidal anti-inflammatories uh, will probably set that off. You know, will probably hasten his demise. So, and the same with steroids. You know, steroids uh, in cats, we, we need them, we use them, I use them every day. Um, but again, in an older cat, you really, you know, you wanna hold off for as long as possible when, when you reach for that medication. And so our video on the right, no kidding folks, this is after two administrations. You know, he, oh, wow running down the hallway, well, he's not running, but he's walking at a fast clip, you know, and I joke with the owner, uh, you know, I said, I don't know if Rafa knows where he's going, but he's on a mission. You know, the other video looked like he was working under a cloud, you know, or in a fog. Um, the next video, for those of you that don't uh, you know, have the video, you're going to hear a lot of barking. It's a trooper in this area, you know, in Kentucky, all these towns were coon hounds. I've learned since I've been in uh, Leesburg, Virginia, that hounds are fox hounds here. So different type of hound, but they are high drive. This dog was sent to me for a lumbal sacral issue um, by a veterinary surgeon because he would spin around and bite it either his left or right hip and just bark. You know, he did this over 30 times a day. He did have some evidence on his MRI of a, of a trauma, but it was really the opposite side. He'd almost turn more to the right than he would to the left, but he'd do both. Um, so this dog, you know, 30 times a day, that barking noise for no reason, spinning, you know, knocking things off the coffee table, knocking drinks over. Uh, he had been on laser therapy, acupuncture therapy, anti-anxieties. Uh, he had been on non-steroidals. Uh, muscle relaxants. I'm unsure if anyone tried steroids on him, but he came to me for a surgical consult. And I was really excited because I, I love doing surgery in the lumbar sacral spine. But I took one look at this video and one look at him and you couldn't make him be painful. And this is a, another manifestation of anxiety uh, or an OCD type behavior in our dogs that have just high energy. You know, we take these this, uh, this hound, uh, you know, he was probably hunting. He probably wasn't a turn in at the local shelter. And, you know, he probably just put his nose down and looked up 12 miles later and didn't know where he was at, you know, and landed up in the shelter. And so when you put these dogs, you know, that are meant to run and chase, and we put them in our lifestyle, you can't see me, thank goodness, from the lower half down, but, you know, I don't get a lot of activity other than what's in the hospital. This is a dog that needs to, you know, be ran seven miles a day. He needs a job and a purpose. And so uh, the owners were kind of uh, at their wits end with, with true medications, wanted to try something else. And I said, well, you know, if you're, if you're open to it, why don't, why don't we try, you know, uh, Ultracell? Again, that's the product that I, I love and, and, and promote. And this is just him in the next video sitting there with his cat. You know, he's got a, a cat friend. And after uh, two to three doses, uh, not doses, but two to three administrations, you know, these events really have since stopped. He may have one every eight weeks, you know, but it's just one, it's very short lived. And the initial 
therapy part of this and the initial administration to see would he benefit from the mood stabilizing effects, um, the owners would give an additional um, serving in one of these big uh, events, you know, they could call him out of it, but if there was one that he just was too turned on and, you know, wrecking havoc during these uh, helicopter maneuvers in the house, they would give him an additional administration and could notice the calming effects, usually within about 10 minutes. Um, let's see what else we've got here. Oh, we've got a horse video coming up. Dan, uh, for those of you, I'll shut up and let you listen. So that's not Jay or me scratching on the computer or the desk. That chewing noise is coming from Dan. He's a, I think, a six-year-old quarter horse, uh, and it's called cribbing. It's a boredom issue, uh, but it can be quite devastating because they suck air in. Uh, they go off their feed because their stomach dilates. They feel full, so they lose a lot of weight. Uh, they destroy barns. You know, they they can really destroy a stall. Uh, with this cribbing, uh, they can also pre it also can predispose them to colicking, and so this can be a real management issue all the way around from your your structure to your horse's health. Um, there are things called cribbing collars that kind of extend the head and neck that I think probably make it uncomfortable to uh, to do this maneuver. To kind of it's almost like a nursing type behavior, but they're actually chewing up the stall. And so again, you could hear him when the owners would walk into the stables, just, you know, just manic uh, chewing on the, on the wood, on the stall door. And when they started uh, him on ultracell, this behavior has since, you know, stopped. He, he doesn't do this anymore. He doesn't have to wear that uh, apparatus that stretches the head and neck out. Um, and, and, you know, we're, we're saving probably hundreds, if not thousands of dollars on, the, on fixing the stall itself. Um, and then, you know, I, I've got several videos, but for time's sake, because, you know, if you pull my chain on this, I'll talk for <laughs> hours. Um, but I always have to mention Samson. Samson was probably the one that sold me uh, on this whole hemp idea, this whole industrial hemp idea, and in particular on Ultracell and, and this company's Elise. Uh, Samson was uh, seen by a colleague of mine for osteosarcoma, cancer of the bone uh, in the forelimb, and uh, he was on... To give you an idea of the type of pain that, that he, he was on and the medications needed to try to control that pain, because bone pain is one of the most severe pains that we have, and it's very hard to control. He had a transdermal fentanyl patch on, and the fentanyl is one of our big uh, opioids, one of our big painkillers. He was on tramadol, another opioid-like medication. He was on gabapentin, a medication used with good action against nerve-based pain. He was on uh, Tylenol of codeine, and this dog was still horrifically painful. Now, part of my job as a veterinarian, you know, as a veterinarian, is all their life issues. These owners, really in the face of, of, of Samson's disease, knew that this was going to be an end of life decision, and, but they wanted him comfortable. I think they had family members coming in for the weekend. And the degree of pain this dog was in with those medications were really, you know, at a loss, short of hospitalizing him and, and, and putting him in a medical induced coma. And that, that's not what anyone wanted. We wanted Samson to be as happy as he could be for the time that he had left. And I happened to have uh, gotten the whole, got signed up with Elise and Ultracell, and, and I had some of this. And the veterinary knew that I liked cannabinoids, and she was asking me about another product that I used to use. And she said, do you think that this product would help? And I said, well, I, you know, first of all, you know, I've been familiar with that product for about 10 years. And, I, you know, I don't think it will. I haven't seen it kind of touch that degree of discomfort. Plus, you've got to order it. So by the time, you know, the shipping and things come in, you know, he's three or four days out. I said, but I've got this new product. Let me run it over to your clinic. You, know, you can just have it and let's see. And the owner called the next day. He had had two servings of it and said that they had to put a leash on him because he was jumping around uh, like a puppy and they were afraid he was going to fracture his leg. So that may not sound like a win to most folks because in the end, you know, we did have a life-ending disease process. But to me, that was an earth-shaking win uh, given the medications he was on and the degree of pain he was on. And I always tell people, you know, if it took me a thousand more pets to have another Samson, I'd, I'd be on board because the things we were using for Samson that we use every day didn't work for him. 
So his pain pathways were directly, I believe, directly influenced by products in this full spectrum hemp oil, the cannabinoids we've got to reach for, but you know, it's the whole complement of those things. And, and he had a very good, you know, last six to seven days of his life because of that one supplement off those other medications. And, and that that's a win. That's a win, Jay. And that, that convinced me, um, probably solidified my uh, passion for this uh, because of the med medications he was on. And then certainly um, just boistered my confidence in the product that I decided to allow myself to. So Dr. Jarva, I know you have mentioned J uh, Jalice and Ultracell. Could you talk to us a little bit more about Ultracell and this particular brand that you use? Um, because um, I think there's one thing that you and I both agree on, um, and this may be that I get on the soapbox. I wish the CBD oil, please work with a licensed practitioner who can tell you how much to use and how to use it. And obviously quality matters the most. This particular industry, um, that is lacking. It's not across the board. You, you cannot go buy CBD oil at a local vape shop or a gas station, buy from a, you know, uh, a, a quality company and a licensed uh, practitioner. So uh, speak to us a little bit about the product that you use in your practice. Yeah, I sure, I sure will. Um I'm going to try to share the share the screen with you here and, and go back to that. You know, I think that uh, for me, uh, what, what turned me on to Zelise, because there are thousands of, of hemp companies out there, thousands of industrial hemp supplements, but I read uh, their white paper study and they did a, a study looking at uh, the bioavailability, what our body sees or absorbs. And in humans, again, in humans, they show it's a water soluble product and they showed up to 94% absorption in the first 15 minutes to an hour with sustained blood levels in humans for up to 12 hours. That uh, blew me away because most other products uh, out there, if you're water soluble, and that's a manipulation of the, the molecule so that it crosses our intestinal barrier and gets into our bloodstream much faster. Um, most water soluble hemp oils were only absorbing about 50%. So you're flushing down, you're, you know, you're pooping out the rest, basically, folks. You know, so whatever you pay for, you know, if it's water soluble, at best, about 50%. Well, Zelise was showing up to 94% in humans. So blown away by that. Uh, true oils, which a lot of the hemp oils are, really at best are only about 10% absorbed. Now, there's a lot of uh, a lot of people who love true oil products, and they'll argue with you. Uh, you know, if, if you're seeing results, people, I, I don't really, I, I don't really care what product you're using. From that standpoint, water soluble versus true oil, if you're seeing results, positive effects, then stay with the product you're using as long as it's a safe product. But true oils, again, only 10% absorbed and you're flushing down you know, the mode 90% uh, of the product that you just ingested. And you can tell if it's water soluble or an oil just by taking a drop, put it in water. If it beads up like olive oil, it's an oil. You know, If it, it disperses in the water, it's water soluble. Um, the other thing that I, I loved about the Zelise product besides that, that uh, correlation, and again, that's in humans, but there's a strong correlate in the dog's intestinal tract and the cat's intestinal tract to our, to our intestinal tract. So we may not be up to 94% in the dogs or cats, but I bet you it's better than the ones that have been studied that show what's called a half-life at a four mg per kg serving twice a day. Um, they're showing that it really has its peak effect for four hours. So a half-life of four hours versus a half-life of six hours. So I, I believe in what I'm seeing in the patients that I've used with the Zelis products nearly three years now, um, I think that it's really close to that 12 hours that we're seeing in humans versus the, the, the two that have been studied on the veterinary side that are showing that they're being labeled or directed as giving two, possibly three times a day, but with half-lives of every four hours, it probably should be in every six hour administration with again, a, do a serving size of four migs per kg. Because of this enhanced bioavailability of the Zelis products, uh, I decided to use a very, very small um, serving size. And, and I use probably 0.01 to 0.2 mg per kg. So you're using just a minuscule amount of this product and I, and I feel we're seeing benefits uh, when we're using it in the majority of cases. Not all, just like in humans. 
You know, about 80% of humans will show some positive effect when you supplement with a good quality hemp oil. And I, I think that we're seeing that in our animals. It might not be what you wanted the effect to be. You know, you may see a different side benefit than what you were hoping for. But again, you know, let the body do with this product what it can and, and see if there are positive effects or not. Um, it's also, the lease products are also um, certified organically sourced. You can get their certificate of analysis with the CO2 extract. Uh, it does not have any uh, toxic products for our pets. They, it is also U.S. Hemp Authority certified. The U.S. Hemp Authority is a, a self-regulating um, administration or, or, you know, and it's, it's kind of like the Better Home and Garden stamp of approval. They, they our third party testing to ensure that what's in that bottle is what's in that bottle. So if you're using a hemp oil that has the stamp that it's U.S. Hemp Authority certified, you know that it's not only met the uh, processing standards of the company, if they're a good company, they have certain regulations and, and things that they adhere to to try to get the best product, but it's also then been third party tested by this U.S. Hemp Authority and certified or given the mark that what is in that bottle is actually what's in it. Because we all know if you're listening to this podcast, you probably are familiar with different hemp oils and different studies that are out there that, you know, the, the problem in the supplement industry, there's probably something like 87,000 supplements. If there's no FDA true regulation, there's no regulatory statutes. So they don't really have to have at all what's in that bottle. You know, you can be buying sugar water. Um, so I think that uh, that gives me extra confidence as well, um, that this, this company is motivated to have the best uh, products out there. And, you know, everyone feels their product is the best. And, and, and I, I would not have aligned myself with this company if I didn't feel that it, it was uh, right up there with the best. And, and because I was getting inundated with so many owners bringing in different products, and I was spending hours, folks, hours of my life you know, looking at websites, calling CEOs, trying to find all these things. I, I decided I needed to get serious and align myself with the company. And that, that's really what led me uh, to Zalise and subsequently to become you know, part of their medical advisory board. Their products that I use on the veterinary side are Zalise Ultra Cell. I love the raw. They've got three flavors, if you will, lemon and berry for the human palate. And then raw, uh, R-A-W, if you can't understand my Kentucky slurring. <laughs> so... And then they also formulated what's called Ultra Cell Pet, uh, which is one fourth the concentration of Ultra Cell Raw. What we found is Ultra Cell Raw, because of the bioavailability, it's so potent. You know, you're using probably one drop per 20 pounds twice a day of dog or cat. So if you've got, you know, a small Yorkie, a four, giving a quarter of a drop. Well, that wigged a lot of people out. You know, they, they forgot about their uh, Miami Vice days, you know, and how to look at something and decide what is one drop, which is 0. 0.05 mils. Again, getting back to my Kentucky slurring, some people think I'm saying a dropper full. And a dropper full is usually 20 drops or one mil. So this is just a, a minuscule amount. So we formulated Ultra Cell Pet, one fourth the CBD concentration. So you're giving, you know, it's one drop of Ultra Cell Pet for five pounds, um, one to two times a day in our small dogs and cats. It's salmon flavored, so again, you know, we're not we're not supposed to taste it as human. That, that one is specifically form formulated for our smaller dogs and cats. I have tasted it and it's not like the salmon I get at the restaurant. It's pretty pungent. And then Ultra CBG. CBG is another isolate. Um, and I love the combination of Ultra Cell Raw and Ultra CBG together. I think that you get a more full spectrum effect and entourage effect with those products on our own endocannabinoid system. Well, in the essence of time, I mean, we've shared a lot of information um, in this episode and a lot of uh, good information here. Um, how would somebody get in touch with you or buy this particular product? Could you share that? Yeah, I'll put that on the screen while we talk about that. That's um, You can go to www.joli.jarboe.com. Uh, and you can also email me at jolie, J-O-L-I, ultra cell, U-L-T-R-A, C-E-L-L at gmail.com. And I'm happy to talk with you about those. If you go to the website, there's some additional 
video and uh, literature information on the, on the supplement product as well. But I'm happy to help you because I want you to be as successful with these products as possible. I, did, I know that we're running low on time, but I did want to stress this, Jay, that you know, anything you ingest, inhale, or touch can have an adverse reaction. And, and a lot of people, when they're dealing with these hemp oils, get a little confused when you see an animal that gets too ramped up or too sedate. They mean the same thing. You've just given too much. Cut your serving size down by half. And then any of us can have an allergic reaction. These are botanicals. So if you see difficulty breathing or hives or excessive itching, stop. See, veterinary, um, see your veterinary specialist or your veterinary healthcare provider. And I also would not use this to treat true diseases. Consult with your veterinarian. See, you know, this, these supplements have their place, but also don't, don't be a, you know, don't practice home doctoring. You know, if you think your animal is ill, seek your veterinary health professional for advice. Yeah, and this is where uh, we want to make sure we mention that, you know, the information discussed on this webinar podcast, is really just for informational purposes. It's not meant to anything to be diagnosed or uh, used for diagnosis purposes. Absolutely. But, but, you know, overall, thank you very much, Dr. Jarbo, for sharing this information. Um, and, yeah, if you need to get in touch with me, I'm Jay Gill. I can be reached at j at compoundingcenter.com for any questions and comments on this episode. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jay.